The Eye of Discernment, 1. An Anthology from the Teachings of Ajahn Lee Damodaro For Sudhidham Maransi Gam Hiramdhakarya Selected and Translated from the Thai by Thani Sarob Hikhu For free distribution only, as a gift of Dhamma Contents Introduction From Craft of the Heart From Keeping the Breath in Mind, Method 2 Introduction This anthology, drawn from the teachings of Fra Ajahn Lee Damodaro, provides an introduction to the basic outlines of his thought and the method of meditation he taught. The first excerpt, From the Craft of the Heart, was written shortly after he had received training from Fra Ajahn Mun Buridato. In it, Ajahn Lee shows how he regarded the state of meditation practice in Thailand at the time, and gives some ideas of why he himself had chosen the path of becoming a meditating monk. The passage from Keeping the Breath in Mind details the method of meditation he developed and taught in the later years of his life. The passage from The Path to Peace and Freedom for the Mind elaborates on a theme he had learned from a John Mun. That there are no sharp boundaries among the practice of virtue, concentration, and discernment, and that all three of these aspects of the path are mutually reinforcing. The three excerpts from Dhamma Talks make a similar point. That there is no sharp division between the practice of tranquility meditation and insight meditation. They also emphasize the role played by experimenting and using one's powers of observation in developing meditation as a skill. The excerpts from frames of reference and basic themes deal with the development of discernment, particularly with regard to detecting the currents of the mind. Both those that flow out and get involved with the world and those that spin around with reference to the mind in the present. So as to touch the aspect of the mind that doesn't flow, even to the present moment. The next excerpt, from the concluding section of the craft of the heart, discusses the goal of the practice as a supreme awareness. Beyond all suppositions. The final excerpt, from a John Lee's autobiography, discusses some of the lessons he learned by living in the forest. My hope is that this anthology will inspire the reader to further explore John Lee's teachings, both through reading more of his writings and through putting their teachings into practice. Thani Saro Pikhu From Craft of the Heart Introduction When I first became aware of the conflicting views held by people who practice, and of how ill-informed they are, I felt inspired by their desire to learn the truth, but at the same time dismayed over their views. Right mixed with wrong, some people saying that Nibbana and the paths leading to it still exist. Others maintaining that Nibbana has passed away and can no longer be attained. This latter belief is a particular cause for dismay. Because a desire for Nibbana is what has led us all to submit ourselves to the practice of the Buddha's teachings in the first place. If we don't have such a desire, we aren't likely to be especially sincere in our practice. And if we aren't sincere, our practice will be in vain as far as the benefits the Buddha intended for us are concerned. Because the Buddha's sole purpose in teaching was to liberate living beings from suffering and stress. If we were to worm our way in as parasites on his religion, it would run counter to his compassionate intentions toward us. Each and every one of us aims for what is good, so we should pay heed to whatever factors may lead to release from suffering and stress. Don't let the Buddha's teaching pass by you in vain. By and large, from what I've seen of people who practice, a great many of them train themselves in ways that mix right with wrong. And then set themselves up as teachers, instructing their pupils in line with their various theories about yajna, Concentration, Nibbana, and the stream leading to it. The lowest level are those who get so caught up with their own views and opinions that their teachings can become detrimental. Saying, for example, that we don't have enough merit to practice that we've been born too late for Nibbana and the paths leading to it, and so have to give up our practice. Opinions of this sort run the gamut from crude to middling to subtle. But no matter what level a person may know, if he doesn't know the hearts and minds of others, he'll have great difficulty in making his teachings effective and beneficial. Even though he may have good intentions, if he lacks knowledge of those he is teaching, progress will be difficult. The Buddha, whenever he taught, knew the capabilities and dispositions of his listeners, and the level of teaching for which they were ripe. 
He then tailored his teachings to suit their condition, which was why he was able to get good results. Even though he had a lot of seed to sow, he planted it only where he knew it would sprout. If he saw that the soil was barren or the climate harsh, he wouldn't plant any seed at all. But as for us, we have only a fistful of rice and yet we cast it along a mountain spine or in the belly of the sea. And so get either meager results or none at all. Thus in this book I have included teachings on every level elementary, intermediate, and advanced. Leaving it up to the reader to pick out the teachings intended for his or her own level of attainment. In practicing meditation, if you direct your mind along the right path, you'll see results in the immediate present. At the same time, if you lead yourself astray, you'll reap harm in the immediate present as well. For the most part, if meditators lack the training that comes from associating with those who are truly expert and experienced, they can become deluded or schizoid in a variety of ways. How so? By letting themselves get carried away with the signs or visions that appear to them. To the point where they lose sense of their own bodies and minds. Playing around with an external kasana is a special culprit in this regard. Those who lack sufficient training will tend to hallucinate, convinced of the truth of whatever they focus on. Letting themselves get carried away by what they know and see until they lose touch with reality. Making it difficult for any sort of discernment to arise. For this reason, in this guide I have taught to focus exclusively on the body and mind. The important point being not to fasten on or become obsessed with whatever may appear in the course of your practice. There are a wide variety of meditation teachers who deviate from the basic principles taught by the Buddha. Some of them, hoping for gain, status, or praise, set up their own creeds with magical formulae and strict observances, teaching their students to invoke the aid of the Buddha. Our Lord Buddha isn't a god of any sort who is going to come to our aid. Rather, we have to develop ourselves so as to reach his level. Some teachers invoke the five forms of rapture, or else visions of this or that color or shape. If you see such and such vision, you attain the first level of the path. And so on until you attain the second, third, and fourth levels. And then once a year you present your teacher with offerings of rice, fruit, and a pig's head. The Buddha's purpose in spreading his teachings was not that we would propitiate him with offerings. He was beyond the sway of material objects of any sort whatsoever. Once the pupils of such teachers come to the end of their observances, they run out of levels to attain, and so can assume themselves to be Buddhas. Private Buddhas or noble disciples, and thus they become instant era ants. Their ears prick up, their hair stands on end, and they get excited all out of proportion to any basis in reality. When you study with some teachers, you have to start out with an offering of five candles and incense sticks. Or maybe ten, plus so and so many flowers and so and so much puffed rice. On this or that day of the week, at this or that time of day, depending on the teacher's preferences. If you can afford it, there's nothing really wrong with this. But it means that poor people or people with little free time will have trouble getting to learn how to meditate. Once you finish the ceremony, the teacher tells you to meditate Araham, Araham, or Budo, Budo. Until you get the vision he teaches you to look for. Such as white, blue, red, yellow, a corpse, water, fire, a person, the Buddha, a noble disciple, heaven, hell. And then you start making assumptions that follow the drift of the objects you see. You jump to the conclusion that you've seen something special or have attained Nibbana. Sometimes the mind gathers to the point where you sit still, in a daze, with no sense of self-awareness at all. Or else pleasure arises and you become attached to the pleasure. Or stillness arises and you become attached to the stillness, or a vision or a color arises and you become attached to that. All of these things are nothing more than agaha nimitta. Perhaps a thought arises and you think that it's insight, and then you really get carried away. You may decide that you're a stream winner, a once returner, or an arahant, and no one in the world can match you. You latch onto your views as correct in every way, giving rise to pride and conceit. All of the things mentioned here, if you get attached to them, are wrong. When this happens, liberating insight won't have a chance to arise. 
so you have to keep digging away for decades. And then get fixated on the fact that you've been practicing a full 20 years. And so won't stand for it if anyone comes along and thinks he's better than you. So, out of fear that others will look down on you, you become even more stubborn and proud, and that's as far as your knowledge and ingenuity will get you. When it comes to actual attainment, some people of this sort haven't even brought the triple gem into their hearts. Of course, there are probably many people who know better than this. I don't mean to cast aspersions on those who know. For this reason, I have drawn up this book in line with what I have studied and practiced. If you see that this might be the path you are looking for, give it a good look. My teacher didn't teach like the examples mentioned above. He taught in line with what was readily available. Without requiring that you had to offer five incense sticks or ten candles or a pig's head or puffed rice or flowers or whatever. All he asked was that you have conviction in the Buddha and a willingness to practice his teachings. If you wanted to make an offering, some candles and incense as an offering to the triple gem would do. One candle if you had one, two if you had two. If you didn't have any, you could dedicate your life instead. Then he would have you repeat the formula for taking refuge in the triple gem as in the method given in this book. His approach to teaching in this way has always struck me as conducive to the practice. I have been practicing for a number of years now, and what I have observed all along has led me to have a sense of pity, both for myself and for my fellow human beings. If we practice along the right lines, we may very likely attain the benefits we hope for quickly. We'll gain knowledge that will make us marvel at the good that comes from the practice of meditation. Or we may even see the paths and fruitions leading to Nibbana in this present life because Nibbana is always present. It lacks only the people who will uncover it within themselves. Some people don't know how, others know, but aren't interested. And have mistaken assumptions about it to boot, thinking. For example, that Nibbana is extinct, doesn't exist, can't be attained, is beyond the powers of people in the present day. Saying that since we aren't noble disciples, how could we possibly attain it? This last is especially deluded. If we were already good, already noble disciples, what purpose would we have in going around trying to attain Nibbana? If we don't despise the Buddha's teachings, then we can all practice them. But the truth of the matter is that though we worship the Dhamma, we don't practice the Dhamma, which is the same as despising it. If we feel well enough situated in the present, we may tell ourselves that we can wait to practice the Dhamma in our next lifetime, or at least any time by right now. Or we may take our defilements as an excuse. Saying that we'll have to abandon greed, anger, and delusion before we can practice the Buddha's teachings. Or else we take our work as an excuse, saying that we'll have to stop working first. Actually, there's no reason that meditation should get in the way of our work because it's strictly an activity of the heart. There's no need to dismantle our homes or abandon our belongings before practicing it. And if we did throw away our belongings in this way, it would probably end up causing harm. Even though it's true that we love ourselves, yet if we don't work for our own benefit. If we vacillate and hesitate, loading ourselves down with ballast and bricks, we make our days and nights go to waste. So we should develop and perfect the factors that bring about the paths and fruitions leading to Nibbana. If you're interested, then examine the procedures explained in the following sections. Pick out whichever section seems to correspond to your own level and abilities, and take that as your guide. As for myself, I was first attracted to the Buddha's teachings by his statement that to lay claim to physical and mental phenomena as our own is suffering. After considering his teaching that the body is an atta, not self. I began to be struck by a sense of dismay over the nature of the body. I examined it to see in what way it was not self, and, as far as my understanding allowed, the Buddha's teaching began to make very clear sense to me. I considered how the body arises, is sustained, and passes away, and I came to the conclusion that 1. It arises from Yupadana. Clinging through mistaken assumptions which forms the essence of Kama. 2. It is sustained by nourishment provided by our parents. And since our parents have nothing of their own with which to nourish us, they have to search for food. 
two-footed animals, four-footed animals, animals in the water, and animals on land. Either buying this food or else killing it on their own and then feeding it to us. The animals abused in this way are bound to curse and seek revenge against those who kill and eat them. Just as we are possessive of our belongings and seek revenge against those who rob us. Those who don't know the truth of the body take it to be the self. But after considering the diseases we suffer in our eyes, nose, mouth, and throughout the various parts of the body, I concluded that we've probably been cursed by the animals we've eaten. Because all of these parts come from the food we've made of their bodies. And so our body, cursed in this way, suffers pain with no recourse for begging mercy. Thus, victim to the spirits of these animals, we suffer pains in the eyes, pains in the ears, pains in the nose and mouth and throughout the body. Until in the end we have to relinquish the whole thing so they can eat it all up. Even while we're still living, some of them, like mosquitoes and sandflies, come and try to take it by force. If we don't let go of our attachments to the body, we're bound to suffer for many lives to come. This is one reason why I felt attracted to the Buddha's teachings on not-self. 3. The body passes away from being denied nourishment. The fact that this happens to us is without a doubt a result of our past actions. We've probably been harsh with other living beings. Denying them food to the point where they've had to part with the bodies they feel such affection for. When the results of such actions bear fruit, our bodies will have to break up and disband in the same way. Considering things in this manner caused me to feel even more attracted to the practical methods recommended by the Buddha for seeing not-self. And letting go of our clinging assumptions so that we no longer have to be possessive of the treasures claimed by ignorant and fixated animals. If we persist in holding onto the body as our own. It's the same as cheating others of their belongings, turning them into our own flesh and blood and then. Forgetting where these things came from, latching onto them as our very own. When this happens, we're like a child who, born in one family and then taken and raised in another family with a different language, is sure to forget his original language and family name. If someone comes along and calls him by his original name, he most likely won't stand for it. Because of his ignorance of his own origins. So it is with the body, once it has grown, we latch onto it, assuming it to be the self. We forget its origins and so become drugged, addicted to physical and mental phenomena, enduring pain for countless lifetimes. These thoughts are what led me to start practicing the teachings of the Buddha so as to liberate myself from this mass of suffering and stress. From keeping the breath in mind, Method 2. There are seven basic steps. 1. Start out with three or seven long in and out breaths, thinking bud with the in breath, and do with the out. Keep the meditation syllable as long as the breath. 2. Be clearly aware of each in and out breath. 3. Observe the breath as it goes in and out, noticing whether it's comfortable or uncomfortable, broad or narrow, obstructed or free-flowing, fast or slow, short or long, warm or cool. If the breath doesn't feel comfortable, change it until it does. For instance, if breathing in long and out long is uncomfortable, Try breathing in short and out short. As soon as you find that your breathing feels comfortable. Let this comfortable breath sensation spread to the different parts of the body. To begin with, inhale the breath sensation at the base of the skull, and let it flow all the way down the spine. Then, if you are male, let it spread down your right leg to the sole of your foot, to the ends of your toes, and out into the air. Inhale the breath sensation at the base of the skull again and let it spread down your spine. Down your left leg to the ends of your toes and out into the air. If you are female, begin with the left side first, because the male and female nervous systems are different. Then let the breath from the base of the skull spread down over both shoulders, past your elbows and wrists. To the tips of your fingers and out into the air. Let the breath at the base of the throat spread down the central nerve at the front of the body, past the lungs and liver. All the way down to the bladder and colon. Inhale the breath right at the middle of the chest and let it go all the way down to your intestines. Let all these breath sensations spread so that they connect and flow together, and you'll feel a greatly improved sense of well-being. 4. Learn 4 ways of adjusting the breath. 
A in long and out long. B in long and out short. C in short and out long. D in short and out short. Breathe whichever way is most comfortable for you. Or, better yet, learn to breathe comfortably all four ways, because your physical condition and your breath are always changing. 5. Become acquainted with the bases or focal points for the mind. The resting spots of the breath. And center your awareness on whichever one seems most comfortable. A few of these bases are. A. The tip of the nose. B. The middle of the head. C. The palate. D. The base of the throat. E. The breastbone, the tip of the sternum. F. The navel, or a point just above it. If you suffer from frequent headaches or nervous problems, don't focus on any spot above the base of the throat. And don't try to force the breath or put yourself into a trance. Breathe freely and naturally. Let the mind be at ease with the breath. But not to the point where it slips away. 6. Spread your awareness your sense of conscious feeling. Throughout the entire body. 7. Unite the breath sensations throughout the body letting them flow together comfortably, keeping your awareness as broad as possible. Once you are fully aware of the aspects of the breath you already know in your body, you'll come to know all sorts of other aspects as well. The breath, by its nature, has many facets. Breath sensations flowing in the nerves, those flowing around and about the nerves, those spreading from the nerves to every pore. Beneficial breath sensations and harmful ones are mixed together by their very nature. To summarize, a. For the sake of improving the energy already existing in every part of your body. So that you can contend with such things as disease and pain. And, b. For the sake of clarifying the knowledge already within you. So that it can become a basis for the skills leading to release and purity of heart. You should always bear these seven steps in mind because they are absolutely basic to every aspect of breath meditation. When you've mastered them, you will have cut a main road. As for the side roads. The incidentals of breath meditation. There are plenty of them, but they aren't really important. You'll be perfectly safe if you stick to these seven steps and practice them as much as possible. Now we will summarize the methods of breath meditation under the headings of Yohana. Yohana means to be absorbed or focused in a single object or preoccupation, as when we deal with the breath. 1. The first Yohana has five factors. A. Directed thought. Vitaka think of the breath until you can recognize it clearly without getting distracted. B. Singleness of object. Ikajitaramana keep the mind with the breath. Don't let it stray after other objects. Watch over your thoughts so that they deal only with the breath to the point where the breath becomes comfortable. The mind becomes one, at rest with the breath. C. Evaluation. Vicar gain a sense of how to let this comfortable breath sensation spread and see a ordinate with the other breath sensations in the body. Let these breath sensations spread until they all merge. Once the body has been soothed by the breath, feelings of pain will grow calm. T. He body will be filled with good breath energy. The mind is focused exclusively on issues connected with the breath. These three qualities must be brought together to bear on the same stream of breathing for the first yohana to arise. This stream of breathing can then take you all the way to the fourth yohana. Directed thought, singleness of object and evaluation act as the causes. When the causes are fully ripe, results will appear. D. Rapture. Pity a compelling sense of fullness and refreshment for body and mind, going straight to the heart, independent of all else. E. Pleasure, sukha physical ease arising from the body's being still and unperturbed, kayupasad high. Mental contentment arising from the mind's being at ease on its own, unperturbed, serene, and exultant, siddhapasad high. Rapture and pleasure are the results. The factors of the first yohana thus come down simply to two sorts causes and results. As rapture and pleasure grow stronger, the breath becomes more subtle. The longer you stay focused and absorbed, the more powerful the results become. This enables you to set directed thought and evaluation, the preliminary ground clearing, aside. And relying completely on a single factor, singleness of object you enter the second yohana, magasiddha, phalasiddha. 
2. The second yajna has three factors, rapture, pleasure, and singleness of object, magasiddha. This refers to the state of mind that has tasted the results coming from the first yajna. Once you have entered the second level, rapture and pleasure become stronger because they rely on a single cause, singleness of object. Which looks after the work from here on in, focusing on the breath so that it becomes more and more refined. Keeping steady and still with a sense of refreshment and ease for both body and mind. The mind is even more stable and intent than before. As you continue focusing, rapture and pleasure become stronger and begin to expand and contract. Continue focusing on the breath, moving the mind deeper to a more subtle level to escape the motions of rapture and pleasure, and you enter the third yajna. 3. The third yajna has two factors, pleasure and singleness of object. The body is quiet, motionless, and solitary. No feelings of pain arise to disturb it. The mind is solitary and still. The breath is refined, free-flowing and broad. A radiance. White like cotton wool. Pervades the entire body, stilling all feelings of physical and mental discomfort. Keep focused on looking after nothing but the broad, refined breath. The mind is free, no thoughts of past or future disturb it. The mind stands out on its own. The four properties earth, water, fire, and wind are in harmony throughout the body. You could almost say that they're pure throughout the entire body. Because the breath has the strength to control and take good care of the other properties, keeping them harmonious and coordinated. Mindfulness is coupled with singleness of object, which acts as the cause. The breath fills the body. Mindfulness fills the body. Focus on in, the mind is bright and powerful, the body is light. Feelings of pleasure are still. Your sense of the body feels steady and even, with no slips or gaps in your awareness, so you can let go of your sense of pleasure. The manifestations of pleasure grow still, because the four properties are balanced and free from motion. Singleness of object, the cause, has the strength to focus more heavily down, taking you to the fourth yajna. For the fourth yajna has two factors, equanimity, apekha, and singleness of object, or mindfulness. Equanimity and singleness of object on the fourth yajna are powerfully focused solid, stable, and sure. The breath element is absolutely quiet, free from ripples and gaps. The mind, neutral and still, lets go of all preoccupations with past and future. The breath, which forms the present, is still, like the ocean or air when they are free from currents or waves. You can know distant sights, and sounds because the breath is even and unwavering. And so acts like a movie screen, giving a clear reflection of whatever is projected onto it. Knowledge arises in the mind, you know but stay neutral and still. The mind is neutral and still, the breath, neutral and still, past, present and future are all neutral and still. This is true singleness of object, focused on the unperturbed stillness of the breath. All parts of the breath in the body connect so that you can breathe through every pore. You don't have to breathe through the nostrils. Because the in and out breath and the other aspects of the breath in the body form a single, unified whole. All aspects of the breath energy are even and full. The four properties all have the same characteristics. The mind is completely still. The focus is strong, the light, aglow. This is to know the great frame of reference. The mind is beaming and bright, like the light of the sun, which unobstructed by clouds or haze, illumines the earth with its rays. The mind sheds light in all directions. The breath is radiant, the mind fully radiant, due to the focusing of mindfulness. The focus is strong, the light, aglow. The mind has power and authority. All four of the frames of reference are gathered into one. There is no sense that, that's the body. That's a feeling. That's the mind. That's a mental quality. There's no sense that therefore. This is thus called the great frame of reference, because none of the four are in any way separate. The mind is firmly intent. Centered and true. Due to the strength of its focus. Mindfulness and alertness converge into one. This is what is meant by the one path, 
Ikea Omega. The concord among the properties and frames of reference, four in one, giving rise to great energy and wakefulness. The purifying inner fire, tapas, that can thoroughly dispel all obscuring darkness. As you focus more strongly on the radiance of the mind, the power that comes from letting go of all preoccupations enables the mind to stand alone. You're like a person who has climbed to the top of a mountain and has the right to see in all directions. The mind's dwelling the breath, which supports the mind's freedom, is in a heightened state, so the mind is able to see all things fashioned, Sankhara, clearly in terms of the Dhamma. As properties, Datu, Kandas, and Sense Media, Ayatana. Just as a person who has taken a camera up in an airplane can take pictures of practically everything below. So a person who has reached this stage, Lokavadu, can see the world and the Dhamma as they truly are. In addition, awareness of another sort, in the area of the mind called liberating insight, or the skill of release also appears. The elements or properties of the body acquire potency, Kaya Siddhai. The mind, resilient power. When you want knowledge of the world or the Dhamma, focus the mind heavily and forcefully on the breath. As the concentrated power of the mind strikes the pure element, intuitive knowledge will spring up in that element. Just as the needle of a record player, as it strikes a record, will give rise to sounds. Once your mindfulness is focused on a pure object, then if you want images, images will appear. If sounds, sounds will arise, whether near or far, matters of the world or the Dhamma. Concerning yourself or others, past, present or future whatever you want to know. As you focus down, think of what you want to know, and it will appear. This is Nana intuitive sensitivity capable of knowing past, present and future an important level of awareness that you can know only for yourself. The elements are like radio waves going through the air. If your mind and mindfulness are strong, and your skills highly developed, you can use those elements to put yourself in touch with the entire world so that knowledge can arise within you. When you have mastered the fourth yahana, it can act as the basis for eight skills. One vipassananana, clear intuitive insight into mental and physical phenomena as they arise, remain, and disband. This is a special sort of insight, coming solely from training the mind. It can occur in two ways. A. Knowing without ever having thought of the matter, and B knowing from having thought of the matter but not after a great deal of thought, as in the case of ordinary knowledge. Think for an instant and it immediately becomes clear just as a piece of cotton wool soaked in gasoline. When you hold a match to it, bursts immediately into flame. The intuition and insight here are that fast, and so differ from ordinary discernment. 2. Monomaity, the ability to use the mind to influence events. 3. Adhivity, the ability to display supernormal powers, e.g., creating images in certain instances that certain groups of people will be able to see. 4. Debasota, the ability to hear distant sounds. 5. Sataparayanana, the ability to know the level good or evil, high or low of other people's minds. 6. Pubhanivasanusadinana, the ability to remember previous lifetimes. If you attain this skill, you'll no longer have to wonder as to whether death is followed by annihilation or rebirth. 7. Dibakaku, the ability to see gross and subtle images, both near and far. 8. Asavakhayanana, the ability to reduce and eliminate the effluence of defilement in the heart. These eight skills come exclusively from the centering the mind, which is why I have written this condensed guide to concentration and yahana. Based on the technique of keeping the breath in mind. If you aspire to the good that can come from these things, you should turn your attention to training your own heart and mind.